Two brothers are born to a noble family, the heir of which is expected to receive a divine blessing and to rule their nation. In a twist of fate, this holy power and the throne that it confers passes instead to the younger brother. The elder brother receives in its place a dark counterpart, an unholy power that twists him into a monster and sets the two at odds. The ensuing conflict ends in tragedy. Traumatized, bereft of a loved one, and held in cruel bondage, the elder brother is preserved from despair not by any real hope, but by unattainable dreams of vengeance. Years pass and the wheel of fate begins to turn, freeing the elder brother from captivity and placing the power of Efreet at his command. Defying the world that denied his humanity and caused him so much suffering, he turns his rage to the heavens themselves, cultivating a resentment towards the divine order and its crystalline incarnation on earth worthy of the biblical Cain. This is the story of Clive Rossfield. Or is it? Because every word of it applies equally well to Arden Izunia. Final Fantasy 16 is full of references to other Final Fantasy games, but it's only haunted by one, its immediate predecessor, Final Fantasy 15. Just as 15 defined itself against 10 and 13, 16 defines itself against 15. In general, 16 draws upon imagery that parallels 15's to serve opposite themes, themes which, in turn, impact the game's overall presentation and mold it into a perfect mirror image of its predecessor. Consider a pair of symbols that defines both games, blood and fire. As shocking as it was to see a child covered in blood in a Final Fantasy trailer, 16 was not the first mainline Final Fantasy to feature such imagery. 16's fiery introduction likewise finds precedent in 15. Both games feature a few out-of-context moments from a struggle against Defreet as a cold open, then quickly revert to a more appropriate starting point within their decade-plus time spans. Such facial similarities, however, belie a fundamental difference in thematic import. In 15, blood and fire speak of sacrifice and the deadly ambiguity of the sacred. Blood is poured out for the sake of others, fire purges the unworthy and immolates the willing victim. 15 doesn't deny the association these primal elements have with horror and death, but by making blood and fire the cost of its world's redemption, 15 insists above all that life is precious, that all the horror and death Noctis is called to bear is a price worth paying to restore order and bring the light of dawn back to Eos. 16, in contrast, makes horror and death the point. Blood and fire aren't a price paid to preserve a world of wonder so much as an indictment of 16's fundamentally broken butcher shop of a world. In a setting so thoroughly marked by blood and fire of that sort, Clive's contempt for the established order, a contempt which, much like Arden in the biblical Cain, reaches all the way up to the heavens, isn't difficult to understand. Ultimately, the way the two games approach the symbols of blood and fire reflect a more basic disagreement. Final Fantasy XV is thoroughly steeped in gratitude for the givens of its world, while Final Fantasy XVI resents its world's givens as terrible impositions. This is what makes it so interesting to compare Arden with Clive. Both reflect the deicidal resentment of Cain over against the self-giving gratitude of Abel, but where XV considers this to be literally demonic, XVI considers it to be the height of humanist virtue. Of course, no one would accept XVI's position if its setting hadn't been designed to justify it. It wouldn't work very well in Eos, where the day-to-day -day life of the average person is absolutely worthy of gratitude, even if there's an impending apocalypse and an evil empire around in need of vanquishing. But life is cheap in Valisthea, to the point that misery is guaranteed for just about everyone unless and until a new and better order can be founded atop the smoldering ashes of the existing one. What makes these two settings so different? Much of it stems from the game's vastly different attitudes towards limited resources where Final Fantasy XV insists that abundance can be generated from limited resources through hard work and sacrifice, Final Fantasy XVI sees scarcity and the conflict it provokes as inevitable. Consider the ways the peoples of Eos and Valisthea respond to the impending end of their worlds. The people of Eos survived for a decade despite a complete political collapse through the efforts of volunteers who band together to maintain a functional electrical grid for a series of universally accessible safe havens. The people of Valisthea, in contrast, continue to treat life as a zero-sum game and slaughter each other in bulk over resources which grow ever more limited thanks to this waste. The game's differing attitudes towards resource management are not limited to the narrative, however. They're reflected even in the game's underlying mechanics. 15 is systemically generous. It stacks system on top of system to the point that it's almost impossible to keep track of them all. 
As much as its battle system is criticized for being too easy, there are a ton of things going on at any given time. Different combos and special moves for each weapon class, elemental and weapon weaknesses and resistances, positional advantages tied to links and link strikes, stagger, multiple dodge mechanisms which play into MP management, status effects and weather effects and field effects, individually targetable body parts whose destruction affects both enemy stats and the spoils earned at the end of battle, team management and character switching, food and experience buffs, and so on. Its ability pool, weapons pool, and pool of unique crafting items are relatively large, and the visual quality of the meals associated with its food buffs is downright ludicrous. It's chock full of unique animations, unique dialogue, unique AI systems, and unique one-off mechanics, and it offers an enormous amount of optional content. Everything from hidden dungeons and hunts, to multiple types of races, to fishing, to pinballs of a coliseum, to a completely out of left field puzzle platformer dungeon in the flying car you need to get there. In other words, 15 never treats scarcity as an excuse to jealously hoard resources. Despite considering itself a true last chance for the series, it allows numerous individual labors of love to blossom. 16, in contrast, applies its limited resources as narrowly as possible. As such, its combat includes shockingly few standard RPG systems, its ability pool consists of nothing more than upgrades to the core abilities available to Clive from the start of the game, plus 4 additional abilities for Icon, its weapons differ only by visual appearance and a couple of rudimentary stats, and its crafting system uses the same few items from virtually everything. Special mechanics thrive within the context of giant set-piece battles at the expense of sharp limitations to the rest of the game. Interaction in side quests and even less climactic story quests is effectively limited to navigation and combat. In other words, 16 systems are as zero-sum as its world sacrificing pretty much everything outside its epic icon fights to ensure that said icon fights and the combat therein are as epic as possible. Strong similarities between the lore of Final Fantasy XV and XVI cast their fundamental disagreements into even sharper relief. Both Eos and Valisthea feature the ruins of technologically advanced precursor civilizations. Both civilizations were destroyed in a conflict with the Divine, a conflict which left scars both on the landscape and on the way their distant descendants understand the human condition. Both Eos and Valisthea are plagued by an entropic force that even its highest deity is unable to subdue. Both deities attempt to resolve this problem by collecting a power greater than their own within a medium of crystal, and cultivating a human host willing and able to pay the ultimate price to channel it. Both Eos and Valisthea feature a healer with divine powers, who cares deeply for this host, and serves as his counterpart. Both healers seek to stay one step ahead of him and keep him safe, despite the degradation of their physical health caused by their powers, a goal which ultimately costs them their lives. Both Eos and Valisthea are ushered towards their deity's desired outcome by a last king, a title for Barnabas that harkens back to a description of Regis from an early trailer. Both kings allow their nations to fall and be overrun by corrupted monstrosities in accordance with a divine plan they expect to lead their world to salvation. The difference, of course, is that Eos's gods legitimately seek the good of their world and its people, while Valisthea's do not. Bahamut demands incredible sacrifices from Noctis and those who support him, but he rewards those sacrifices with the salvation of the world. Ultima's schemes, in contrast, benefit nobody but himself. In a sense, the divine principles of Eos and Valisthea act under the same assumptions of abundance and scarcity that their peoples do. The Astrals exist so they might use their great power to preserve Eos, Ultima uses his great power to preserve his own existence at Valisthea's expense. The elephant in the room, of course, is Bahamut's non-canonical counterpart from Dawn of the Future. Like Ultima, he seeks to annihilate mankind and recreate the world, only to be defeated by the very same power he'd been cultivating within humanity. It's worth emphasizing that this Muhammad is manifestly not the same character as the Bahamut depicted in 15 proper. In an audacious act of character assassination, Dawn of the Future not only contradicted Bahamut's canonical behavior and comrades, but also retconned Eos' history going all the way back to the War of the Astrals. But it's clear that something of this alternate universe made its way into 16. Given that the fate of the Citadel in Dawn of the Future appears to have been replicated wholesale in the raising of Origin and the subsequent aerial assault required to access it. Oddly enough, despite 16's edgy anti theism, its evil god's obsession with self preservation casts him as something more like a god of evolution than a monotheistic creator. An avatar of pitiless indifference, which crafted deterministic hominids from pre existing matter only for them to attain true humanity in spite of him through the unexpected emergence of free will. 
This is yet another factor that allows Sixteen to successfully imbue Clive with the burn-it-all-down rage of an Arden or a Cain without coming off as villainous. With that said, it's hard to shake the feeling that, in the final analysis, Final Fantasy XVI harbors resentment towards the very concept of a divine order, not just with regards to Valisthea, but even with regards to reality itself. While XVI's thematic inconsistency makes it possible for Ultima to be taken as a warning against utopian ideologies, or Clive's title of Logos to be understood in a reasonably Christian way, I suspect that the key to the game's intended interpretation can be found in two particularly didactic side quests. In the first, Clive is told to find and protect a book which purportedly reveals the hidden history of the Bearer's oppression. After he defeats the secret society of censors seeking to erase it, however, the head of the group claims that whether the book is accurate doesn't really matter. The true history is nothing more than what people believe about the past. When Clive confronts the Hideout's resident historian about this, she basically accepts the claim in principle. Her interest in the book and in history itself lie not in their ability to report past events accurately, but in their power to create new truths by changing what people believe. In the second, Clive finds a member of a secret order who had gone AWOL, and watches in horror as the man sacrifices his own life to ensure that some cultists find the salvation they so earnestly seek, the salvation of the coming mindless monsters. When he confronts the head of the order about this, he is told that the order's real purpose is to free people to live and die however they want. It's strongly implied that Clive's distaste for the whole sordid affair is inappropriately judgmental. Nihilism this extreme, the outright rejection of both objective truth and objective morality, strongly suggests that the divine title 16 applies to Ultima are just as willfully blasphemous and steeped in anti-theistic resentment as they seem. And this, I think, is the real reason there's such an intense rivalry between 16 and 15. 15, like Abel, aligns itself with the Divine Order and assumes that it's appropriate to respond to its goodness through willing sacrifice. But in doing so, it unintentionally becomes a lightning rod for the Cain-like resentment of its brother. In the end, it's hard to argue that 16's worldview comes out better for the conflict. 15's insistence that the world's abundance is something to be grateful for results in a heartbreakingly beautiful finale, where most of the cast survives and Eos remains full of both enchantment and technological convenience. 16's attempt to deal with the problems of a zero-sum world by punching God in the face leaves four of its five major protagonists dead and Velocity is subjected to a low-tech limbo for the sake of preventing magic-induced climate change. I know which world I'd rather live in.